Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, November 3rd. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing, making beer at home. Well, this week, the second part of our three-part interview with Dave Logston of Y Yeast. In this section, we answer some of the questions that came from listeners about yeast and how to get the most out of it. We've got a pretty long interview this week, so I want to go quickly through a couple of reminders and the mailbag and get right into it. First of all, the reminders, this Saturday, November 5th, is American Homebrew Association's 7th Annual Teach a Friend to Homebrew Day. Each first Saturday in November, homebrewers around the world are encouraged to invite non-brewing and brewing friends and family together to celebrate the occasion and brew a batch of beer. Well, I have to say I got a jump on things last week when my friend John came up from Hot Springs, Arkansas, and we brewed an all-grain porter together. Uh, John wound up buying an equipment kit and an ingredient kit before heading home, and uh, he's got a honey wheat beer of his own fermenting happily. So uh, congratulations to John and and welcome to the the club, so to speak. Also, if you look on the American Homebrewers uh, Association website, beertown.org, you will find the recipe for Poor Richard's Ale scaled down for a five-gallon batch. If you'll remember, that's the recipe that was commissioned to celebrate Ben Franklin's 300th birthday. That's coming up, I believe, in January. And I want to thank Ray Daniels for following up on that and providing that recipe tailored for homebrewers. I plan on making that recipe myself, and I'll put a link to the recipe on basicbrewingradio.com. From the mailbag, Brian from Houston suggests we do a show on homebrewing clubs. I think that's a great idea. Brian says he's a member of the KGB. That's uh, Kirkendall Grand Brewers. He says the KGB is a very active club with over 100 members. And you can find their site at thekgb.org. That's T-H-E, K-G-B dot O-R-G. I also want to say howdy to Rob in Sydney, Australia, who says, uh, who asks, any chance of an all-grain DVD? Well, it's in the works, Rob, and I appreciate your asking. Stay tuned for uh, more details on that. And Dave in Naperville, Illinois, says he really enjoyed the interviews with Bob Hansen on malts and the malting process from our archives. He says it was fascinating stuff from a guy who obviously loves his job. Well, Dave, you'll be interested to know that I've got another interview with Bob in the can, so to speak, that uh, I've been waiting for the right time to run. In that interview, Bob gives us some helpful tips on getting the most out of an extract brew, and I plan on running that in a couple of weeks before we get into all-grain brewing with uh, John Palmer. Thanks to everybody who's written in. I really enjoy hearing from everybody. Now, let's get on with the uh, the interview, as promised. The second part of our interview with Dave Logston as we jump right in with listener questions. Well, let's start with some general uh, yeast background questions. And uh, Aaron in, in La Habra, California, has, has a good one. He says, My wife and I were both wondering what brewers did before the age of the microscope with regard to isolating yeast strains and cultures. Was everything wild yeast? That's a good question. You know, uh, we know that uh, it does take yeast to make alcohol. There's uh, really difficult to do that otherwise, and and uh, brewing goes way back to the uh, beginning of civilization. Um, that's why people settled down. I think is because they had to uh, grow barley to make beer, and so uh, it, they they found out that uh, when um, Sugar solutions, whether it was grape juice or or uh, or, uh, from, or grains, uh, that they would ferment and produce alcohol, and they liked the results of it. But they had no idea what was causing this for literally uh, centuries. The um, the process became a little bit more refined as they had continual use of the same vessels. And what essentially was happening is that they had had wild yeast that. Uh, uh, had found a, a sweet home to uh, to grow. That, that's what the, the yeast wanted to do. They they were there for their livelihood, not to make beer or bread, as, as far as that goes. But uh, uh, as they became adapted to that same environment, uh, some of their characteristics changed, and they were were um, desirable to the effect that it uh, if they weren't contaminated with lactics extensively and gotten very sour, uh, they made a nice tasting beverage. Uh, 
and it was a little bit of selection over time as the as the years went on, and it was in monasteries is where when brewing was 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 uh, was taken uh, over for the most part throughout Europe. Uh, they had essentially begun selecting wild yeast, and I think that's why you find a lot of Belgian uh, beers and the Belgian yeast types that are available now came through uh, uh, refinement over time from uh, from a wild uh, yeast that were originally started from. And then once we got close to uh, Pasteur's time, when the microscope uh, did come around, it was the uh, understanding that, well, we have good beers coming out sometimes, and then we have bad beers coming out sometimes. What's the difference? And it was the microscope that helped us identify what the yeast was. It, uh, before that, yeast was had a had a term called God is good. If the if the beer came out well, God is good and we got good beer and that's what uh the little white stuff in the bottom of the tank was uh was a good thing, but again they didn't know what it was at that point. Over the period of time those uh those yeast strains uh became isolated and the good ones were used for brewing and the uh ones that uh, didn't produce such uh good uh fermentation characteristics were were discarded essentially. So they all came from a wild source originally. So it's, it's all kind of accidental selection. Yeah, yeah, a little bit ac- accidental and by, by chance and, and by, but uh, also they knew if they had um, um, beers that um, didn't taste so good, they didn't want to go back to those same vessels, and they would they were selectively doing it based on flavor to some extent. You know, it reminds me of a story uh, going through uh, a lambic brewery in in Belgium, which you know is all wild, still wild fermentation for the most part. And uh, if you walk through the um, the barrels of uh, of uh, lambic in the cellar, and if you tap on the barrels, you can determine which ones are the best ones, which ones have the best wild cultures in them, because the hollow sounding barrels have the best tasting beer in them because hmm. that's where the employees are drinking out of and, and the, <laughs> the volume is going down and and uh, hence you can hear the hollow uh, sound of the wood telling you this is the one to try uh, okay wayne from uh, from lansdale pennsylvania writes and he has uh well i kind of distilled his uh his questions into uh into shorter ones because he, he he originally uh and he, if you if you send in a question to the show, you can you can thank Wayne because it was his idea uh, to ask for questions. Oh, uh, good. Because it was coincidentally he he uh, wrote in a, a question for me on yeast, and I said, well, you know, Dave's coming on. I'll just ask him. You know, uh, and then uh, Wayne said, well, it's too bad that everybody can't have a chance to ask a question. So thanks to Wayne. Uh, first of all, he says, how many different kinds of yeasts are there? Well, if we're talking about Saccharomyces cerevisiae, uh, there's literally thousands of strains. I, mean, I know of some yeast banks that uh, have uh, over a thousand strains themselves that have, that have been isolated and, and typed um, for their unique properties. So there, there's an awful lot of them. Besides Saccharomyces, there's uh, so many other types of uh, wild yeast, uh, even the Britannomyces yeast that uh, we use in brewing. We've got a few strains uh, that have been identified uh, of uh, of that genus. But uh, there's uh, more out there than probably uh, uh, we'll ever get a chance to, to uh, even work with. And uh, is there an advantage of either dry or liquid yeast? I, we I, we, I find, we the, find that <laughs> liquid yeast provides more typical flavor and esters. Um, I was going to say, I'm, I'm asking the, the producer of the, the liquid yeast. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll probably give you a little bit of a uh, uh, slanted opinion, but I think my uh, my opinions uh, lie strongly with uh, most of the brewers in the world uh, use liquid yeast if they have a choice and the option. And uh, that's one of the things that I found, that's why I'm in the business, I think, is when I started brewing, I started brewing with dry yeast, and I thought, okay, this is home brew, and then I got those uh, those uh, pure liquid cultures that I started brewing with, and I, and I noticed the difference, and I said, this is a, this is a very distinct, significant difference, and it's worth pursuing, so I did, and uh, I believe there's a lot of people that have uh, looked the same way and, and said, yeah, you get better flavor, better esters, better better flocculation, better attenuation. Oftentimes, uh, yeast that have gone through the drying process change. Uh, 
uh, they, they, and the uh, liquid yeast tends to be more consistent batch to batch. Dried yeast, yeah, it can produce it can produce beer, but uh, it uh, doesn't give you the same characteristics. And I know we've got some other questions down here. Um, yeah, Brendan from Tulsa asks, why is there such a variety of liquid yeast but not dry? Well, and and again, it, it, going through the drying process, uh, a lot of those a lot of those characteristics are dry, are, are lost. Um, I kind of equate dried yeast to uh, white bread. You know, it's once you've had white bread, it pretty much tastes the same. There's not a lot of characteristics that say, "Well, gee, I like this Wonder Bread better than Billy Bob's bread because uh, I, I like the taste so much more." It just you kind of lose the, lose the flavor, and it's kind of neutral. And and what you're looking for more than anything else is uh, unobjectionable flavors that come out. Uh, oftentimes in the drying process, um, uh, there's a lot of air used in the drying process of yeast, and and I think there's some oxidative character that carries over through the beer that comes from dried yeast, as well as if there's uh, wild yeast or uh, bacteria present, they can give you some off flavors as well. So there's a number of things there in the drying process that really take away from uh, from uh, the true characteristics that brewers are looking for, the flavor uh, that uh, yeast can provide. It's, it's, it's an important part of it. Uh, uh, if you dry one yeast, it's... Um, not going to taste that much different than another dried yeast, even though you've got two different strains because you lost a lot of that characteristics that uh, that those yeast have before they went through the process. Wayne has uh, one more question. He he emailed because he had pitched a, a batch of beer, pitched yeast in the in the beer, and hadn't seen activity in a while, and he was wondering. Uh, you know, he had used a, a Y yeast pack that was uh, a few months old, and he was wondering how long it would last. And and turns out that he he did the smack pack, and you know, instead of waiting for you know the allotted uh, number of days to to let it swell up, he just waited a couple hours and you know pitched and uh, hadn't read the instructions on the pack. Essentially, <laughs> he says it's a guy thing. Well, talk a bit about the, the, the smack pack, you know, the the activator pack, uh, and talk about what's in it and, and what happens if you do, do just smack it, rip it, and pitch it. Well, that's uh, that's a good question. There's uh, a, a lot of um, variables that come in the fermentation process, yeast having one of the biggest factors uh, involved in uh, getting good, healthy yeast ready to go into the beer. That's, that's the living organism that, that uh, needs to be uh, managed in the best way possible. So when we, we first got into the business, the, I designed the smack pack so we would know yeast were active. That was the primary fundamental thing, that the yeast just wasn't dead on the shelf and you were not going to get any uh, good fermentation going on. So uh, the smack pack uh, has nutrients in it, and when that... Uh, inside package is broken and mixed with the yeast, what that does is that starts the, uh, the, the metabolic processes for the, the yeast coming from dormancy where they've been laying uh, into active fermentation. So they're taking up nutrients that we have in that smack pack and they're starting, they're getting, they're getting their uh, uh, metabolism up to uh, a point where they can start taking up sugars and 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 have a good healthy fermentation, so it gives them a little bit of a uh, of an edge compared to just coming out of uh, out of uh, the refrigerator, tearing it open, and throwing it into the wort. If if you uh, activate the uh, package and even don't allow it to swell, uh, they're still going to take up nutrients very quickly. And whatever they don't take up while they're still in the package and fermentation beginning, they're gonna they're gonna utilize it in the worts as well. So the delay from uh, not uh, waiting is going to be less than a few hours uh, difference in uh, the how fast they're going to come up and ferment. Uh, the packages we produce now have the same pitch rate that the uh, brewers use when they calculate how much yeast to use when for a batch of beer. And that, uh, along with the stability that we've uh, worked over years to continue to maintain with our yeast, all those factors should show us a lag time of uh, of uh, typically six hours if you have fresh yeast. Uh, then you should see some fermentation going. And it, like I say, it may not de- be delayed more than an hour or so if you uh, activated a package and put it right into the into the wort. So a uh, little bit lost, but not enough to uh, make a significant difference.
Now, Brendan also asks, and I get, let me ask this, this question of his, and maybe that will answer a lot of the other questions that will come across. He asks, what is the number one most important factor from a yeast perspective to getting a good fermentation? But I don't know that you want to narrow it down to just one, do you? Well, uh, there are uh, there there are a number of uh, number of things, but um, there's one that I think gets overlooked or misunderstood more than anything else, and that's the uh, aeration of the wort or the oxygen that yeast need to start their fermentation and complete their fermentation. There's it's very critical that uh, the missing element oftentimes is oxygen, and uh, brewers have some very different ideas what oxygen means. Some brewers think that if you leave the top off and it's exposed to the air, that's aeration. That's what they need. Uh, that's not the case. Uh, other <laughs> brewers think that if we just splash it into the carboy, uh, then that's a lot of aeration and that's all they're going to need. So we've got two different uh, views of it there, and, and neither one of them are very good. Uh, a lot of brewers now use aquarium pumps with aeration stones, which helps out some. Uh, a lot of the brewers just shake their carboys uh, until their arms fall off, and uh, that's actually a pretty good method. It, you get pretty good. We want dissolved oxygen into the wort, and that's, and, that, and that's what the yeast need. The yeast take that up. Uh, probably the best system that's out there is the uh, a bottle of uh, oxygen with the aeration stone used. That combination is what professional brewers use, and that's what works extremely well. Let me give you an example of uh, how the uh, yeast need this oxygen. Uh, they, the oxygen helps the yeast produce sterols. Ergosterol is the sterol that's primary and it's very important that the sterol is produced because when they go dormant after uh, fermentation before or during propagation, they have very little of the sterol left. When in ideal conditions with plenty of oxygen, they can produce about 1% of cell mass into sterol. So that's like a full tank of gas, 1% of uh, sterol production when you have plenty of aeration. Now... As that uh, yeast takes up uh, nutrients and uh, produces alcohol and CO2, the sterol is being depleted. Plus, when they produce a daughter cell, as we know yeast grow, I, I kind of failed to I mention that earlier, but I think most people understand they, they, they divide asexually and they produce a daughter cell, and now there's one yeast cell becomes two. Well, they, that first yeast cell gave half of the sterol it had left to its daughter cell, so now after one budding, we're down to a half a tank of gas already or less because we've used some through the fermentation process. So by the time this yeast buds four times, four reproductions, it's out of gas. Hmm. And that's what causes uh, high terminal gravities or stuck fermentations is they run out of sterols because they didn't get enough aeration initially when they were pitched. Adequate number of healthy yeast and adequate aeration are those two variables that are the most important factor that uh, brewers have to deal with. And if they do it right, then they come to terminal gravity at the same time, basically, that the, the yeast run out of gas, and they'll stop there. The, uh, in, in stuck fermentations and high, high terminal gravities, it's not a factor of, uh, of the yeast being dead. It's just that they have to take up that, uh, produce more sterols. And it's not easy for them to do, but uh, oxygen is the easiest way. And that's why getting back to that primary, secondary fermentation, when uh, the beers are racked from primary to secondary, that rousing that occurs and that little bit of aeration that uh, happens uh, when, that, uh, when that transfer is made is that little bit of pickup and sterile production to get that secondary fermentation to kick off. And that's, that's how... Uh, secondary fermentations are valuable is when you didn't get it done right for initially with uh, adequate uh, yeast and and uh, aeration. Now, if you had uh, tons of yeast and very little aeration, you could ferment out entirely uh, with only one or two divisions of uh, cells, but that's kind of impractical and it really affects the flavor profile as well. So that's it's getting that pitching rate right, aeration adequate, 
Now, as the gravity of the beer goes up, especially when you get some of these really big, strong beers, you need more aeration or oxygen. Usually at a point when you get above about 1080 original gravity or so, you can't get enough oxygen into the word by using air only. Even with the best diffuser or best stone, you're going to need pure oxygen to get the, the oxygen up to 25, 30 parts per million in the end of the wort so that you've got adequate oxygen in there for the yeast because not only do you need more aeration for high gravity beers, you need more yeast as well. And so getting the pitch rates up high enough for a high gravity beer along with the aeration will give you that good fermentation all the way through and a good complete uh, fermentation from, um, from the start. And uh, that is probably the biggest problem that brewers uh, come across, whether it's low-gravity beers with no aeration or inadequate pitch rates or, or lack of adequate aeration to the high-gravity beers where it's compounded and uh, gets much more difficult to uh, get the, the performance they're looking for. I tend to be a shaker. <laughs> shaking works good. We found that shaking actually works better than an aquarium pump. Really? Yeah, as long as you got, as long as you got the stamina. To, to get a good, I, I, we've got some. We did some studies on it, and I think it was only about uh, four minutes of, of good heavy shaking that gave us enough dissolved oxygen for a uh, typical uh, gravity beer. That makes me feel better. Yeah, <laughs> you, you, that's a lot of work. I mean, you could, <laughs> hopefully, it's hopefully it's working for you. Chris, you know, I'm I'm almost always happy with my beers, so you know. Whatever I'm doing is at least adequate enough to get to, you know to the level of quality that I'm happy with. So, <laughs> well, you know, and, and 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 that's a that's the biggest thing. If you don't worry about it too much and you follow some basic fundamentals, you can make some pretty good beer. And it uh, may not be uh, perfect in some people's eyes, but it, if it tastes good, uh, that's really the bottom line. And and uh, and we're all about getting better in this uh, show too. Is becoming better brewers along the way. But your last comments uh, kind of lead into. I'm going to skip down to Casey's question. Casey from Salem Springs, Arkansas, uh, up near me here in Northwest Arkansas. He says uh, he needs some high gravity yeast advice. He brewed a 1.115 uh, original gravity imperial stout, a big beer. Uh, he used Y yeast, uh, yeast nutrient, aerated for almost an hour with an aquarium pump and a stainless air stone, and pitched on the entire yeast cake from a lower gravity batch. And he says, alas, this is White Labs, dry English uh, ale uh, yeast. Uh, temperatures in the 68 to 70 degree range, fermented like mad for three days, and then it was over. He waited for another two weeks to rack it into the secondary, and his final gravity was still 1.042. Uh, less than 65% uh, apparent attenuation and way too sweet. says, does David have ideas for what I can do now? Well, once you, once you get a stuck fermentation, they're difficult to get down where they need to be. And, and one of the reasons is is that um, uh, the yeast have utilized a lot of the amino acids and nutrients that they needed uh, initially on that uh, uh, fermentation and so those are depleted so even if adding new yeast sometimes they're not going to work quite as well but that's really what it does take is some good fresh healthy yeast whether it's the same ale yeast that you started with or something that might be a little bit alcohol to- more alcohol tolerant uh, like a champagne yeast or even a belgian yeast depending on uh, what flavors you're after uh, this can be done by making a good um, aerated yeast starter you really have to go to a starter at that point you Oxidizing the the wort is uh, is a possibility at this point. Not that great of an issue because you still have a lot of uh, CO2 that's going to push air out of there before it oxidizes much. Big beers tend to um, not show uh, oxidation as easily as lighter, uh, more delicate beers do. But uh, making a good, healthy, aerated starter and pitching that in. Uh, I would rack it at the same time to get it off of any tube that's settled out. If you haven't already, uh, that would be beneficial. Uh, and get it, let it warm. Let it free rise in temperature a little bit because the yeast like it uh, uh, warmer than cooler. Uh, let's see, I think he mentioned that he pitched it about um, 77 Fahrenheit. And... Uh, yeah, six, 68 to 70. Range. Oh, 68 to 70 on that one. So that that is, which is pretty typical, but you could um, 
could allow that to rise to the mid 70s and get a little easier on the yeast, a little less stress, and and uh, get it to ferment out. He might be able to get that down from a 042 down to about uh, maybe 20 mid 20s or so. I would say it'd be about as low as he might be able to get it, but which it would it would dry it out considerably. And he's already over nine and a half percent alcohol with, so he's. He might be able to get it up to about 11, 12 uh, percent with a little bit of time and that fresh yeast in there. Uh, I think he can uh, bring that around to where it's going to be a, a pretty good drinker and, and uh, stick around for a while too. I mean, a big beer like that um, uh, will uh, age really well. So, so I was my my first uh, impulse was to say uh, champagne yeast, but but just pitching a fresh batch of uh, well aerated uh, the same yeast that he started out with and a good starter. Uh, yeah, that, uh, is that uh, I don't know what the alcohol tolerance is on that particular strain that he used, but um, most ale yeasts will go ten and a half to twelve uh, if they're pitched in a suitable quantity. But if you do get into a champagne yeast, you could probably get maybe twelve to fourteen percent uh, is probably possible. But uh, there's other factors that are going to be limiting as well, and that's why I think even if he comes down a bit, down below 30, like I mentioned, uh, he's going to have a, a beer that's going to be pretty decent for uh, for profile. Now, Bill from uh, Greenbrier, Arkansas, which is around the, the central part of the state, has some questions. In fact, he had a lot of questions. I kind of divided them up amongst the, <laughs> amongst the list here. Uh, and what you said kind of keyed on one of his uh, uh, questions. He says... I've read, at least for ales, that it's okay to warm pitch yeast a bit above room temperature, such as 76 to 78 degrees, and that as long as the fermenta- fermenter temperatures drop to the preferred 65 to 68 degree range within the first day or two, that there'll be no problem with undesirable esters, while at the same time the warmer temperature will help bring about a quicker start. Does that go along with kind of what you were saying? Exactly. That that works really well uh, for ales. Uh, bring them in in the, in the mid seventies, uh, and even just if you if you're going to say ferment at sixty five to sixty eight, and that's where your cellar or uh, uh, basement or garage is at, uh, at uh, without any temperature control, it's going to come down uh, appreciably in about twelve to twenty four hours and settle into that temperature, and you won't have uh, a significant amount of uh, ester formation at that higher temperature that's going to be adverse. Um, more more common, uh, though, is um, to start on the cool side and allow the temperature to rise through fermentation. If you can do that, uh, it's a little bit slower start. People get nervous about slow starting fermentations, but actually uh, what happens is uh, there leaves a little bit of the fatty acids from the wort to produce esters, uh, some of the some of the compounds that are uh, necessary for ester formation, and allow that fermentation to rise towards the end, up to say 75 degrees, it helps get a complete and thorough fermentation, and gets a ni- little bit of nicer aromatics and nicer uh, uh, fermentation properties. Uh, that would be a temperature range for ales uh, that work good. Um, for lagers, it's even fermenting. I think in the old German textbooks they started around 45 Fahrenheit, which is even cold for a lager. Uh, long, long lag time. Allow that temperature to rise up through the mid-50s or even in today anymore, it's even up to about 60 for the completion of a lager fermentation. So you do get some nice aromatic properties uh, even for that style of beer developing through the course of fermentation a lot, starting cool and, and finishing warm. So there's some benefits uh, both ways. Uh, the, uh, starting a new yeast is one of the things that we put on our packages to start in the mid mid 70s uh, to make sure that uh, you're not too cold. And that uh, slow yeast, uh, cold shock on yeast, it's all strain dependent, but it's, uh, it seems to be gene associated that uh, uh, if you get the temperature too cold for yeast, they just... Uh, don't ferment at all, and will lay there dormant for uh, extended periods of time, and uh, that not only makes brewers nervous, but it doesn't do much good for the uh, the beer once it uh, it's finally done either. So, yeah, you want your fermentation to start fairly quickly. You I want it started. It's you know that's you know people say, oh wow, I got it rocking in in uh, you know less than two hours. It fit great, and and it fermented out in in three days, and 
yeah, that's a good fermentation, but uh, I think you find that you lose some of the uh, nice uh, sensory properties that uh, can be in the beer if with too quick a fermentation on the other end of the extreme, or even if it's too warm and too short, uh, some of the higher alcohols and things can also be adverse. So if you get, if you know you got a good pitch rate to begin with and you got a good aeration, uh, you've got a, a lot more latitude with that rate of fermentation and, and, and that lag time because uh, you're going to get predictability with um, having things in place up front. The, I guess the, the best advice is to, to keep good notes, and uh, if you come up with a beer that you like, uh, try to duplicate uh, what you did before with the you know the timing and all that. That all that all adds up, and uh, one thing about uh, home brewers, we tend to be experimental in nature, so it's difficult to go back and do those same things without changes. And, and one of the things you learn in science is to make one change at a time, so you can actually measure the difference of of, of that uh, variable that you've uh, you've changed, and um, that gives you more identifiable results from from changes that you do make. Let's go to our question from. Uh, Bob in St. Louis, who who emailed us a sound file. Cheers, James. Thanks for inviting me to tell a bit about my home brewing experiences, and especially when it comes to yeast. I was so worried about my first batch of beer that we drove all the way from St. Louis, Missouri to Belleville, Illinois, probably about a 50-mile round trip. Nice place to go to, but I was worried about getting fresh yeast, and we actually transferred it back home and a cup of ice to make sure that it was nice and fresh. When I got home, I did the starter and the flask and spent a lot of time. The first batch of beer I ever made was great, although I thought it was pretty much a hassle. And I used that method for about three or four more batches. I even tried some dry yeast and made a nice Irish stout with it. Tastes just like the, uh, the most popular brand out of Ireland over there. But as I kept experimenting with different styles of beer and the availability of the different strains of yeast that were available, I came across the Activator Packs, which is a starter and the yeast all-in-one. You give it a smack, and uh, some new, there's a little nutrient bubble, and it busts inside of this envelope. You shake it up, let it uh, sit for about 12, 24 hours, even less. Um, you really don't even have to activate it, but it blows up to just show you that... Hey, well, it doesn't blow up like a bomb or anything. If it if it expands like a balloon, you, you can see what's going on, that the yeast is working and that it's going to be great to pitch into your work when you're ready. I only brew a few different styles, so I only need a few different strains of yeast. I usually get about two to three batches out of each of those activator packs after transferring my beer from the... Uh, primary fermenter into the secondary fermenter after about a week well the slurry that's left at the bottom has plenty of nice yeast and i just pitch that into the next batch whether i have to store it in the airline flask or lately uh jim spencer told me about uh washing yeast and i washed it out in, in a mason jar <laughs> and uh and saved it for the next batch and that seems to have worked fine I'm interested in trying to get the most batches out of one of those activator packs, how I can sample yeast, and that's my question, Dave. I want to know how I can keep that yeast going as long as I can, what kind of starters, what kind of samples I have to have, and when do I know, when I do a starter, when do I know that I have enough yeast to pitch for five gallons of beer? Well, we've got to we got to thank Bob for his creativity and uh, coming up with that sound file. And and you can you can hear Bob. Uh, he's the host of a uh, podcast, incidentally called uh, Snake Alley, and you can find that on uh, GaragePunk.com Pirate Radio. And uh, Dave, what he does is he uh, he plays uh, kind of punk rock uh, music that's obscure, and he also takes these old uh, uh, horror movies. Uh, from the the 50s and such, and, and uh, reviews them and plays the sound cuts for it. Oh, I'm going to check that out. Yeah. <laughs> it's a it's a pretty funny show, but he he uh, he covers a lot of mileage uh, in that uh, clip. Yeah, he, um, he I think uh, some of his issues are uh, it's a challenge to, uh, to get get brewing yeast, and uh, he wants to make things as easy as possible and uh, cost effective as possible as well. 
And he also mentioned that he's uh, made a uh, Irish stout using dry yeast, and it tasted great. Well, one of the things that we talked earlier about uh, some of the some of the um, limits of dry yeast, and I think that uh, one of the places that you see less of an impact on flavor is on the bigger, stronger, darker beers uh, because there's so much coming from the malt that it kind of obscures some of the nicer uh, uh, properties that uh, come from the yeast. But I would have to venture to say if I were to put two side by side, one with dry yeast and one with uh, good liquid culture, uh, I think we'd know uh, which one people would prefer just by being able to take a look side by side. So it's all relative. Yes, you can make good good beer with uh, dry yeast, but just how good is uh, really uh, uh, a question of debate, I guess. But I won't go there. I will uh, <laughs> uh, try to answer some of his questions uh, that he also uh, posed. So he's, he's pitching the slurry from his uh, primary fermenter into his next batch of beer, you know, stretching the yeast mileage uh, that way. Yeah, well, that's a lot of brewers do that. Uh, commercial brewers have to do it just because uh, there's so much uh, yeast demand in a commercial brewery that propagating it uh, all the time is, is nearly impossible. So, they, Or just buying the yeast all the time would be cost prohibitive for the volumes that they need. And in fact, it's an interesting note is that uh, brewers are the only uh, people in the world that reuse their yeast. Uh, winemakers don't, distillers don't, uh, bread makers can't, and uh, uh, brewers really need to. It's an, uh, an essence for them. And uh, frugal home brewers uh, uh, do as well. Um, as I mentioned earlier, yeast are going to bud three to four times uh, during the course of fermentation, so you're going to end up with about three to four times more yeast than you start with. Now, harvesting the yeast off of a uh, primary fermenter and, and, and uh, washing it or storing it in the refrigerator is, is an effective way to be able to reuse that yeast. There are some uh, yeast washing techniques essentially trying to remove some of the trube and some of the CO2 and maybe diluting some of the alcohol off the yeast so it's a little more stable during storage. Now, the length of time uh, brewers can store their yeast is uh, has always got a lot of debate as well. If you talk to a large commercial brewers, they'd say, well, we don't store our yeast more than three days. Well, that's uh, that's nice because uh, they want good, healthy yeast that are uh, ready to go, and, and uh, making light lager beers doesn't allow for much uh, variation. And just uh, just a side note, uh, lager yeast are um, uh, have much a higher metabolic rate than ale yeast do. They essentially burn themselves up more quickly than what ale yeast do, and their stability over time and reuse is limited to a fraction of what uh, ale yeast repitching can be done. So keep that in mind. Just uh, usually uh, lager brewers won't go more than about three generations, oftentimes three reuses in the best conditions, making light lager beers, uh, and maybe as many as ten, you know, stretching it a bit. So and there's some things that they can do sometimes, like, like washing yeast that uh, can help uh, lengthen or maintain that viability for that many repitches. So um, if you were able to use your yeast three or four times, whether it be an ale yeast or lager yeast, uh, I'd say that's doing pretty well, uh, pretty cost-effective at that point. Uh, looking for um, good fermentation profiles, good flavors of the beer that the yeast are coming off of before you decide to reuse it as a factor. Uh, storing it cold in the refrigerator, maybe up to a few weeks, maybe a maximum of a month might be uh, uh, what uh, some would consider a, a good practice. And if you're brewing about once a month, you could probably keep that culture going for, for a few times. Now, one thing I'd uh, caution people about, if you're brewing uh, higher gravity beers or higher alcohol beers, once you get over about uh, 5 uh, percent or so alcohol, that becomes uh, starts to become quite toxic to the yeast. So they'll be sitting dormant in that alcohol. They'll be uh, uh, suffering a lot, and, 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 and the stress on them uh, will have an impact on uh, their performance and viability once you do uh, bring them out for reuse as well. I think that Bob was talking about uh, not washing his yeast, but pitching the slurry from the primary into the the next batch of beer. Are we going to run, if we do that without washing the yeast, are we going to run into the issues of the autolysis and and the uh, 
you know, the problems with, is it essentially letting the new beer sit on old trube and, and yeast bodies? Yes, that's, that's very well put, James. Uh, you're essentially accumulating that, uh, the dead cells in trube uh, over consecutive batches with more age time on it. Uh, that's going to start to have a, a impact on the beer after after doing that once or twice. I think you'd start to notice that. Getting that off the trube uh, is, uh, and separated from that is part of the washing technique. So if you're not doing that, um, it's uh, it's it's going to have an impact and, and and maybe end up with some some flavors coming up that you don't want, or maybe a higher dead cell population over time that uh, may actually um, uh, have some uh, fatigue factors in getting a good fermentation through the yeast that you do have there. Now, one practice that uh, uh, brewers will will often do is they'll get a get a fresh yeast culture and uh, produce a say a small beer or or moderate gravity beer, and they'll rack it off of that primary fermentation, and brew a big gravity beer right in on top of it, and not even wash the vessel or anything, just leave it all lay and just go right in there and produce a big beer and and to have a big healthy uh, pitching rate essentially by uh, all the uh, additional yeast that have been produced. And that's a pretty effective way to get a, get a second brew out of it, no handling at all. And uh, you've got a good healthy pitch rate, for, again, for that high-gravity beer. Then, then at that point, I wouldn't be using yeast off of, off of, uh, off of that because it is uh, under a lot of stress with the, um, with the alcohol at that point. So maybe going back to a fresh culture off of that might be, uh, might be prudent. Also, there's so many good yeast strains uh, to use, well, even if you're making only a few different styles, there's uh, literally dozens of strains that you can try and, and experiment with to uh, broaden your uh, horizons on uh, on uh, the types of beers you're going to be making. Now, now there are instructions on your website on uh, for a washing te- technique, so I don't know if it, if we want to take the time to go through that because it's a fairly elaborate process. Well, I've, I've got to mad. I can't imagine that if uh, listeners are uh, are tuned in, they'll they'll be able to find our website and get access to it. Uh, I we also uh, not only we do produce yeast here, but we we're brewers. Uh, I brew professionally and have been involved with a full sale brewing company here in Hood River, Oregon, for uh, nearly as long as uh, the laboratory. So. We get questions all the time, whether it's about yeast washing, yeast handling, yeast aeration, and if they can't find answers on our website, they can email us and, and, and get the uh, uh, feedback directly, and we're more than happy to provide our expertise. Uh, I'm a brewer. We've got three other uh, microbiologists on staff that are uh, brewed professionally and at home as well, so we've got a good depth of and resource for information that people can follow up and uh we answer all those questions and uh everyone uh uh whether it's a big commercial brewer or or, or a home brewer that's uh first time uh they're all our customers and we want to make sure we take care of them so uh i, I don't getting into that uh right now may not be the easiest thing to do and if they had a chance to look at the procedures in front of them first that might make it a little easier to answer good questions about that. And, and what I can do is I can put a, a link from the description of the show on our website uh, to the page on your site about uh, washing yeast. Oh, that'd be fantastic. That'll, that'll, that'll help them out a little bit. Now, the, the last thing that Bob asks is, uh, when do you know when you've got a starter that, that's big enough, you know, the starter that's got enough yeast for five gallons of beer? Well, uh, you know, we, we produce our activator package with uh, 100 billion cells. And that's enough yeast without a starter. As a number of your listeners mentioned, that they just uh, pitch it direct in, and uh, it works very well. So you know, if you have an activator with 100 billion cells, you've got enough for uh, gravity uh, beer up to about 1060 or thereabouts, right in that right in that area. Good fresh yeast. Don't need a starter. Now, if you're going to make a starter. Uh, we've got some guidelines on on how to do that, uh, but if you're going to uh, make a, uh, a a 1080 or 1090 or even a, a 1100 uh, gravity beer, you're going to need that two to three times more yeast. That's where I got. If you yeast produce about three times as much in a five gallon batch of beer that you started with, you'd have enough to pitch a very high gravity uh, beer with the yeast that was produced from that uh, first beer. Uh, 
I'm making a starter. Uh, a lot of it has to do with just the um, state of fermentation that the yeast are in. There we call it, uh, there's a lag phase, which we know it's a slow uh, starting process where the yeast are taking up the nutrients. Then there's the uh, logarithmic growth phase, the, the log phase, and that's where it's very actively fermenting. And when the yeast are in that state, in a in propagation and you put them into uh, wort, uh, that's an optimum condition. So if you were able to do that and at least started with a uh, known amount of yeast to um, uh, get into that starter and get it actively fermenting, the in uh, optimum conditions, those yeast with lots of variation, they're going to double about every uh, uh, maybe four hours on average or something like that, depending on temperature and conditions. So you're going to get a couple of doublings in a in the course of a, a fairly short period of time, which should give you that cell mass that you're looking for. And as a home brewer, you aren't doing cell counts with a microscope, and you're you're really working by uh, volume. And uh, we did a little uh, experiment, and we had some 50 mil centrifuge tubes. Uh, that we sell our yeast nutrient in. And if you harvested yeast and had about uh, 50 mils of that, uh, excuse me, uh, 25 mils of that 50 mil tube, you'd have about uh, the right cell count to pitch five gallons of beer. So thinking about that, if you have your yeast settled out and uh, about 25 mils of uh, solid uh, yeast settled out uh, for every uh, uh, five gallons or for every uh, 50 original gravity points, you'd have a rule of thumb to use for how, knowing how much yeast you're going to need in order to uh, get the proper uh, pitch rate for the beer that you're making. So, so those of us who, who uh, neglected to uh, study the metric system uh, too intensely in school. How? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, about so. Uh, Twenty-five mils is a little over. Excuse me, a little under an ounce of yeast by volume. So, but so about an ounce ounce of yeast by volume. Solid, solid packed out yeast. Yeah. yeah. So that's again, that's a little bit nebulous because uh, what's you know how much is in a slurry, for example. But if you if you took our um, our um, activator package and you open that up and put it in a in a uh, tube or something like that you'd see that it's about uh, uh, a third solids so you're you're looking at about a hundred billion cells for five gallons in about a um, little over a um, uh, ounce or an ounce and a half or maybe two ounces of solids depending on how well it's packed out again that affected by how the yeast flocculate and each strain's a little bit different. So it, it, it's not an exact dose. We can't just say go use a measuring spoon and, and add this amount of X because X is always a variable. That's the one thing about brewing is that uh, the consistency is never absolute. The variables always are changing, and when you're harvesting yeast and repitching or you're making a starter, those variables change with temperature and time and, and uh, nutrient concentration and, and nutrient profile and and uh, it goes on and on. It, it's 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 not a it's not a fixed easy thing to uh, to answer. Experience is the best best thing. Taking good notes so that when you when you are following some fundamental uh, procedures that you know what the results are and you can duplicate those as you uh, continue on in your hobby. Well, next week we wrap up our chat with Dave Logston of Y Yeast, and we also read his answers to additional questions that have come in. Thanks again to Dave for all his help. We really appreciate all the information. It's very, very interesting and very helpful stuff. If you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say hey, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. And if you're wanting to get into home brewing for the first time while you're on our site, you can check out our DVD, Basic Brewing, Introduction to Extract Home Brewing. We'll walk you through the process step by step. You can see a listing of the fine folks across the country who sell our DVD while you're on the site. And if there is an vendor in your area, you can order it online. 
Well, that's all until next week. Until then, thanks for listening. I'm James Spencer. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website is provided by Kelly Dodson. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time. So long.